This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I want to kind of take a, a different approach and motivate my talk by looking into the future, what's coming, and what does that mean in terms of a variety of different scenarios in terms of how we go forward from the standpoint of food. So my simple message is going to be that demand for food is going to grow dramatically in coming decades. Um, the impacts, environmental impacts, are going to be enormous depending upon the way that proceeds. Um, I'm going to make the argument that seafood is way better than land food in almost every way we can talk about that for reasons that I'll show you. And so that my end message is going to be the more in this coming growth that we can shift that demand to seafood relative to land-based food and particularly animal-based uh, land foods, uh, the better from the standpoint of the planet. So there's, there's the message that I'm going to come across. So here's, here's the challenge. If we look at the nature of food consumption on the planet today, and this is animal food production, um, animal uh, protein consumption, um, it's growing dramatically. It has grown already in the last 30 years, pretty dramatically. Um, and you know, there you can see the breakdown of various components. Land-based meats, 72%. That fraction is going down. The ocean fraction has been going up. Um, and so this is what we've seen over the last 30 years. Um, if we look out in coming decades, uh, this growth is going to accelerate. And it's gonna, it accelerates for two reasons. First, let me just show you, um, so this is one of these cartographs. So here, obviously, this is a map of the world. But every country is the size of the actual country. Um, but we can also do this in the way that you change the size of all these countries on the basis of some kind of data. So the total land area is going to stay the same, but for these plots, the size of the country is going to reflect various aspects. So if we look at current population size, this is the way the globe looks. Okay? So that's obvious. Everybody knows that there's a lot of people over in Southeast Asia. Um, and so those areas blow up in a very big way. Um, if we look out 30 years to 2050, well, more than 30, to 2050, um, most of the growth happens. There's significant growth still in Asia. And there's also a lot of growth in Africa. Okay, so there's going to be increasing demand that's going to grow in specific geographies. That's one reason why that growth is going to go up. Um, the other uh, has to do with growth in wealth. And this is just a simple pattern that has been observed over and over again across all kinds of different countries, that as the per capita income increases, the fraction of the diet that comes from meat goes up. And this, hap this is a plot that shows this across countries. Uh, but the same kind of pattern happens if we look at growth and wealth within countries. So the patterns in China, for example, over the last 15 years have been dramatic in terms of big increases in per capita wealth um, and a huge increase in the fraction of diet on a per capita basis that comes from animal-based protein. Okay? Um, if we look, again, this as a geography, where has the growth in, in wealth actually been happening? Well, Part of it, of course, has been in the developed world. But that's really not the growth that matters from the standpoint of food, because that tends to be growth in wealth for people that are already pretty well off. But it's really this growth that's happening in Asia that is going to be the other big driver. And, and this is a, a, a huge factor if we look out, project over 30 years, and the anticipated growth in wealth that we see within the developing world. So it's going to be Africa in terms of people. It's going to be Asia for both people and wealth. And if we put those together, come back to this figure and project out to 2050, if you just assume nothing constrains the growth in consumption, um, this is what we project by 2050. Roughly an 80% increase in total animal food consumption within the next three and a half decades. 
that is a whopping amount of additional food to produce. So the question I want to talk about is um, how can we meet this? You know, and, and one answer may be it will not occur because you can't produce that much additional food or the environmental consequences would be so large that it'll constrain the growth. Those are really important things we should be talking about. Um, but the, uh, the basic point I want to talk about is that the path that we take to meeting this demand really matters. Now, uh, some of these projections came from a paper that Dave Tillman and his group did a couple of years ago that looked at this problem and then looked at it and the consequence is for land-based food production. And so they projected out a whole variety of different scenarios about how you could actually produce that much additional food. And I don't want to go into the details of this uh, study very much other than to say that all of the scenarios are ones that you really would not want to um, choose, right? They're all bad in terms of having very big impacts in terms of land conversion, biodiversity losses, greenhouse gas emissions, nutrient loadings of watersheds, a whole variety of different things. Now, what they showed is that the strategic choices of different pathways, if in fact there's any way you could direct the way they go by different kinds of policy options, have dramatically different consequences. But from the standpoint of if you're trying to produce that much food from land, it's a big set of problems from the standpoint of these environmental impacts, all right? So we, you know, and I mean, just to give you an example, uh, look at greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, it doesn't get a lot of attention about how big the uh, component of gr total greenhouse gas emissions is that comes from food production. Everybody talks about buildings and energies and transportation, but if you look at the, these components, livestock production, um, agriculture, and then some component of land use and transportation to be able to move that food around, you're talking about a third today of global greenhouse gas emissions are coming from food issues. And so if you're talking about increasing that for the meat side, which is one of the biggest components here by 80 to 100% in some projections, it's a big deal. And so um, the consequences though uh, turn out to be really different, of course, depending upon what you choose, where that, where that growth occurs. And so for the standpoint of greenhouse gases, um, what this plot shows for four different types of land-based meats, the average level of greenhouse gas production for a given level of protein. The height of the bar is the average for existing types of production. The, 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 other, the second color is showing you what's the lowest level for any form of um, life cycle assessment we have for any form of production for that kind of meat today. Okay, so it's, you can kind of think of that as some scope for opportunity using best practices or technology development and things along those lines. And this is the kind of work that Dave uh, focused on in terms of thinking about a variety of different kinds of uh, land-based meat production. What he ignored was the ocean. And, and the reason I want to show the, you know, that this is an important emission is because when we start putting ocean-based food production on here, one of the things that you can see is that Let's take well-caught fisheries for a second. There's a lot of variability. Mostly in fisheries, it's due to how you catch the fish. It's not on the basis of the species uh, for obvious reasons in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but again, if you look, in some of these cases, you can't even see the blue, the second color bar. And so even if we look at the average or if we look at best practices in almost every one of these categories, the best practice today is an order of magnitude or more better than best practices for any form of land-based production you can get on land. Okay? So there's a big potential for the scenario to be not quite as bad if, in fact, we start taking oceans into account. So Chris already showed you this morning that you know, one of the possibilities here is let's increase f uh, food production from wild-caught fisheries. And that's an incredibly important thing to do because not, he, the other thing that, you know, he talked about the fact that this is beneficial in, in multiple axes. He didn't talk about it in the context of these kinds of environmental costs, but it actually has benefits relative to all other forms of meat production because fixing fisheries in most cases actually lowers the environmental cost, not increasing them but with that increased production. So more fish, easier to catch them. The fuel cost per fish goes down instead of going up. A whole variety of other things that come out of this. So that's all well and good. Um, we should be 
taking advantage of this in a huge way. But let's come back to this problem and, and just ask, suppose the projection is correct and we were able to fix all the globe's wild-caught fisheries, how much of this projected growth in demand would that potentially be able to meet? Well, there's the answer. In case you didn't see that, because it's kind of small, there it is. It's, it's about 8%, okay? Now, 8%. So what does that mean? Well, I, I mean, on the one hand, you can say, well, why bother with wild-caught fisheries? But as I just said, this is the low-hanging fruit in the sense that it has all environmental benefits, no added environmental costs in many ways. In fact, in some ways, the net goes down uh, for a lot of the different metrics I'll show you in a second. But the other is, as Chris pointed out, that if you don't fix this, this part of the problem, this bar gets bigger because you actually have less um, production of wild-caught fisheries and under a business as usual scenario. So the challenge of meeting the growth in demand by 2050 actually gets worse if we don't fix this problem. So we've got to do this, but it doesn't solve the problem. Okay? So let's come back to aquaculture. We talked a little bit about the regulatory environment. There's been a fair amount of discussion about environmental challenges with aquaculture, um, important questions to raise. But I think one of the key things is that we tend to talk about environmental consequences of different kinds of food production in isolation. So we talk about the fact that aquaculture puts nutrients into the coastal ocean, or it has uh, potential effects on disease or exotic species. Well, those tr that is true for all forms of food production. And so if we don't think about this as a level playing field analysis, we can be dismissing one opportunity and making choices that inadvertently dramatically increase the exact thing we tried to worry about in terms of blocking uh, increase in aquaculture production. And so I want to just point out that you know here's a variety of different forms of aquaculture production. Some are fed, some are unfed, and this unfed in the sense that we're not having to provide food. They're, util they're things like mussels and oysters. You can grow them in the ocean, you can grow them in ponds, you can grow them in, on land in recirculating systems. And again, what happens in this situation is if we look at the best practices, even today in this relatively you know, new technology compared to other forms of food production, it's better than any of the options on land. And in some cases, you, know, you can't even see the greenhouse gas emissions for the best practices one for unfed aquaculture here. OK? So what does this mean? Well, what I want to do is that the, the results on greenhouse gases, people have published various components of that in a variety of ways. Uh, but one of the challenges when we start thinking about environmental impacts is there are a lot of them. And sometimes there are trade-offs that you can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So for example, one of the things that a lot of people have tried to do to reduce the nutrient impacts of aquaculture is move it into recirculating systems on land to where you're not, you can filter out a variety of different compounds in the water before you release it back into. So you solve one problem, but as you can see from this, as soon as you move these into these recirculating systems, you increase the greenhouse gas emissions on average, again, by an order of magnitude. So you're getting trade-offs between different kinds of environmental problems. So what we want to look at is, does this story that you know here there are ways of uh, producing the same amount of food with dramatically lower greenhouse gas emissions hold true when we look at other kinds of metrics. So I'm going to do a thought experiment to be able to um, show you how this might work. Because, I mean, I just showed you what those different greenhouse gas emissions were, but I don't think anybody can translate, well, what does that mean? You know, how big of a deal is that for the planet? Does this raise the temperature by, you know, some three degrees, one degree, a tenth of a degree? You know, it, it may be that there's big differences between food, but all of them are relatively small in the grand scheme of things. So I want to look at four kinds of environmental costs, greenhouse gas, land or sea conversion to where you're con having to convert it into other uses, um, nutrient loadings of the environment, and uh, the fourth one is water, fresh water use. <clears throat> um, and, and just to, to, to kind of put this in the context, I'm going to calculate. So imagine we produced all of this growth in demand by just one form of food production. So let's think about, suppose you did it all with beef, or suppose you did it all with chickens, or you did it all with um, 
farmed salmon or you did it all with mussels? What would that look like? What would be the total aggregate consequences of doing that? So here's, here's what I've done. I've simplified the categories down. Um, and the, the browns are things coming from land. Blues coming from the ocean. And I've also put on this, you know, the other way we can think about this is one way to solve some of this problem is to reduce that uh, shift to more animal based protein to look at what the consequences are if, in fact, you look at this with other kinds of vegetation uh, foods, vegetable foods. Okay? So here's greenhouse gases. I've already shown you this kind of a thing, but now in aggregated categories. And you get this factor of on the order of 50 between best options and worst options that occur here. Um, and I'm gonna go through these quickly. Fertilizer demand, same kind of a thing. A little bit of shift in order between um, some uh, types of organisms, but you know, dramatic differences. And in some cases, you get situations like this where the best case practices for unfed aquaculture are actually lower than any of the options are for even just shifting diets to a vegetarian diet. Freshwater use, same thing. Area use, same kind of thing. Okay. Now, so basically what this shows is there's not dramatic trade-offs. It's not like the aquaculture uh, was really good for a couple of these and terrible for other ones. Um, it's better, on average, than most of the options on land. And in, most, in many cases, it's dramatically better. In some cases like this, you're talking about Worst, best case to worst case is a factor of 500 fold difference. But you probably have no way of interpreting what is uh, two, you know, two, 20 million or two million kilometers squared or anything like that. So I want to put these into context that allow us to think about this. So let's continue this thought experiment. I'm going to take, for, e for three of these metrics, I'm going to show you the worst case scenario and the best case scenario if you produce the food just by that particular thing. So uh, these guys are worse from the standpoint of land area. And so how much new land area would you have to put into food production to meet that growth in demand by 2050 if we do it all with sheets and sheep, sheets, sheep and goats? It's about 85% of South America. That's a lot of land in new forms of food production. Okay? By contrast, at the other extreme, mussels growing at rates that we can grow them today using existing technology like they do in New Zealand. What does it look like there? It turns out to be less than the shallow shelf surrounding New Zealand. So it's one thing to look at this in a graph. It's another thing to see what the consequences are of very different ends of the spectrum of how different food choices would influence the amount of conversion of area, whether it's on land or the sea. Let's do greenhouse gases. A new worst case scenario is now cows. So how much would we increase greenhouse gas production if in fact you did this all with beef? Well, it turns out you would be adding 81% of China's current total CO2 emissions to the greenhouse gas problem, or 130% of what the US actually does today. That's one extreme. Greenhouse gases for mussels, it's roughly the emissions of the UK. So again, this is hundreds of times difference in terms of adding to the greenhouse gas problem associated with foods that shift more to in this direction relative to foods that shift more in that direction. Water, I'm almost done, last one. Thought experiment number three, water. Um, water's tricky because you have to kind of figure out what water do you count. If you count all the rainwater that goes into the crops that are fed to these things plus the irrigation, then it turns out you'd have to be adding fresh water comparable to the volume of Lake Huron, one of the Great Lakes, um, to be able to produce that much additional beef. Okay? Um, if you only consider the irrigation part, how much we're having to actually use um, water that we, as opposed to just growing it in the right place, it's comparable to 
Lake Tahoe in terms of the volume of water you'd be adding in terms of global irrigation somewhere to be able to produce it with beef. What about the other end? Well, it'd probably be less than a bucket full um, for this one. I mean, this is, the, this is the extreme case because there's basically no freshwater component to that form of food production. So I just want to end here and make the point that if we really think forward about this sustainability problem, it's, it's partly an issue of what are our environmental challenges today, but I think we also have to be really thinking about what is the future going to look like and what are the alternative scenarios. And to the extent that we um, have a situation, you know, to, to the extent that different policies influence the frequency at which we're going to have fish, whether it's from wild caught or from aquaculture, as part of that demand, and fish I mean broadly, um, both fin fish and shellfish, um, the environmental consequences to the planet are dramatically lower in a whole variety of different metrics than if, in fact, this growth in production continues to be predominantly from land-based animal protein. So I'll stop there, and we can chat about how we're going to actually meet this demand. Great, great talk, Steve. Uh, I assume from what you said that you don't believe in a, a, a Malthusian scenario uh, as opposed to the other two. Uh, <laughs> how, how do you believe that your 40-year projection on increasing uh, seafood outcome with fewer impacts will be uh, affected by the rate of ocean acidification that Charlie Kolstad and his 800 international teams of scientists are now predicting? Well, that, that's a very good question, and Chris already raised this issue, but I mean, um, you know, the, the, here's, the, here's the added piece of this. If we look at where we project growth in demand for seafood, the dark green here is ranking all the countries by this 50, 2050 demand, not for total uh, meat consumption, but this is seafood consumption on the basis of their existing preferences for seafood versus animal protein. The, the top 10 countries are all right here. And Chris already showed you this figure, which shows that um, that is also the area where you know, these projections on the basis of just warming, none of the other things that Lisa talked about, where we project something on the order of a 50% decline in productivity. So there's a big, interesting geographic component of this, too. I mean, that, this doesn't mean that um, this is going to create huge food security problems necessarily in that particular place, but it does influence the, the, you know, I mean, because if uh, the other thing I can show you here is, you know, here's here's if we look at how f where fish exports are back one of these maps, you know, that this is the part of the world that exports fish like crazy, um, and here's where the imports go. All right, so but so th there are, there are all kinds of trade and other kinds of implications of this, but the place where the demand is going to grow the most is also the place where we have the potential for some of the biggest declines in productivity. Same thing is true for Africa. So the two places where it's either wealth or population growth is where you've got these big um, effects coming. Yeah. Just look at it specifically. Yeah. Can we actually grow all those mussels? Well, that, that's a really good question. It depends on where you grow them, right? I mean, so, so it may be that, I mean, you, you probably can't grow mussels in a lot of those tropical areas today because they're, they're, they're low productivity waters. That's not where you'd be growing filter feeders. You might, you know, you'd be, going, you'd be better off doing something like Hunter's been working on with giant clams, which are basically plants that have shells because they're using, they're captured microalgae as a source of food. But so, Unfed aquaculture in a lot of the tropics doesn't work because you don't have a lot of water column productivity for them to be able to really be able to have high production. Some places it works, but a lot of places it doesn't. Uh, um, th thanks. Um, I certainly get this and great graphics. Um, but I'm curious about uh, dairy and you know, cheese, milk, and egg, because you talk about meat and the protein conversion is a little different. Yeah, so I, a couple of those slides I actually had dairy in there. Um, and dairy tends to be lower environmental costs than meat production for the same animals that are producing it. Um, but so that's true. F 
That's true for milk in cows and goats. It's also true when you're thinking about eggs from chickens. So both of those tend to be lower um, for all of these metrics than the, um, than the, you know, the meat itself. But, not, but still higher on average than what a lot of the options are from the sea. Yes? So two assumptions. One was the wealth. I wonder what you based that wealth growth on. And the second is, uh, those are cultural assumptions that you have got an answer through aquaculture, but the assumptions that people would eat those ways are pretty large assumptions. So that's a big challenge. Yeah, so that's a really good point. I mean, and so all of this is talking about policies. If you're really going to change the way these outcomes are going to play out, you're talking about policies that somehow influence behaviors. Um, and those could be because prices go up and people can no longer afford to eat one thing versus another. It could be an educational thing along those lines. In terms of the projections, they're based upon uh, current patterns of uh, increase in wealth within countries. It's based, all of this is really driven by people that are moving into the middle class. And so virtually all of that growth in wealth that is affecting the food demand is coming from projections for China and India. Um, and so it's, you know, there are economic forecasts about how their uh, economy grows and how that leads to growth in the middle class within these countries. There are a very large number of people that potentially move into the middle class, and that drives a huge part of that. That's literally half of the global demand is that uh, gl global increase demand. So, yeah, it could turn out that if you don't have that growth in wealth, a lot of this doesn't happen. But um, that's the, the pathway that we're on right now from economic projections. I have two questions. One is, I just saw a film called Cowspiracy, and they mentioned that for every fish that's caught, uh, there are five that are sacrificed, including mammals and turtles, dolphins. And the other, which really you know concerns me, and the other question is about the biodiversity and overfishing, and um, how can we do this without starving other sea animals that depend on, on fish for food? So that, it's two very interesting questions. I mean, so I'm, I'm not trying to say that there are no impacts of, of production from the sea. Obviously, bycatch for wild-caught fisheries is a, a big challenge in the sense that there's some fraction of other kinds of species that are being incidentally caught. Um, and that has biodiversity implications, and it has you know, other kinds of ecosystem implications that may also feed back to the, the effects on fisheries. And that all of these things are things you, you, we want to reduce as much as possible. Um, but there are also biodiversity implications of food production on land. I mean, if you had to convert an area the size of South America to new forms of food production, the biodiversity implications of that would be unbelievable. And, and it's, so it's, it's a different pathway in terms of affecting biodiversity than indirectly catching something in a net. Uh, but it's not that all, all these forms of food production have biodiversity implications. And it's either through land conversion or incidental effects or the uh, you know, spraying of pesticides and what those do to uh, areas outside of. So there's, that's why I think this has to be done in a level playing field analysis. You can't think about this as this form of food production has awful uh, consequences, and so I'm not going to eat that form of food, if in fact then your alternatives that you switch to are dramatically worse, you've just made a, a decision that's not very rational, right? And, and so I think we need to be looking at this in, in a, a, a greater array of different environmental impacts, but the shocking thing that's been coming out of this for these four major components is, is that aquaculture, which I think it's more press about the environmental impacts of how bad it is, turns out to be consistently one of the best things relative to all other forms of food production, in many cases even including agricultural products themselves. I was going to thank uh, Chris for asking me to talk, but maybe not if I have to talk after, <laughs> after Steve with something uh, so beautifully done. But uh, I'm going to do something a bit different, which is uh, look at at aspects having to do with, uh, with the potential for, for transitions and shifts in systems. And this is uh, something which is very different, I think, than what we've heard before, though I'm also going to come up with some uh, 
some general conclusions and some general issues are going to match very much what we've heard this morning. I have actually cut out almost all the equations, at least, uh, <laughs> since it's right before lunch. So uh, there are lots of, uh, lots of systems which have shown uh, sudden shifts in which could cause real problems for trying to get food from, from the sea or from anywhere else. This is a, uh, one of these classic uh, graphs of what happened when it shifted from the Sierra um, forest to the Sierra desert uh, in terms of uh, shown by the accumulation of terrigenous dust. And another classic example is the shift, uh, potential shift uh, from a nice uh, oligotrophic uh, lake to a eutrophic lake. And another one could possibly be the shift from a healthy reef, uh, which has got lots of coral and uh, not a lot of macroalgae to an unhealthy reef that's covered by uh, macroalgae. And uh, other examples could be things like uh, uh, urchin barrens or perhaps fisheries that have not yet recovered. Have they shifted to a state from which they really may take who knows how long to recover, like cod in the uh, uh, Atlantic, Northwest Atlantic. And what I want to do is spend some time going through a uh, one example in a little bit of a uh, small amount of detail because it uh, gives some very general lessons that are going to be important. And this is the idea of looking at uh, coral reefs and uh, grazing. And uh, this is uh, the idea that parrotfish uh, in the Caribbean are the only grazer that's left, which prevents a uh, coral from turning into one of those macroalgal dominated states. And one can write down a very simple description of this. You could do it by a simulation model, and actually sort of that's what happened was that Pete Mumby did that, and then I suggested that we could do this this other way, where we just look at the percentage of the seabed or the, the, uh, essentially that is covered either by macroalgae, turf, or coral, and use that as a way to write down a description where uh, you incorporate the idea that macroalgae can overgrow corals or turf. You have the idea that uh, uh, corals can settle and, and grow where there are turf, that uh, um, corals, when they die, can be replaced by turf. Uh, macroalgae, when it dies, can be replaced by turf, or if it's grazed, can uh, turn into turf. And if you analyze this, write down a simple description, you get a system where as a function of the grazing intensity, uh, you can have, uh, at very low grazing, you can have an equilibrium which is, in terms of coral cover, is very unhealthy, essentially no coral cover. If you have lots of grazing, the only possible outcome is lots of coral cover. And then you have an intermediate region where you can either have uh, low coral cover, which solid line is, is a stable outcome, that's an unstable outcome, or you can have uh, high coral cover. And so you have a region and you have essentially hysteresis. If you reduce grazing, it'll be healthy, healthy, healthy until you get down to here, it'll drop here, and then for the same levels of grazing, uh, the system won't recover instantly. And this is one aspect which has been mentioned before, but I think is maybe not appreciated enough uh, maybe even ecologists have incorporated some ideas from engineers, you'd say, okay, well, tune up the grazing intensity and everything will be, be fine. But the only thing you can do, the only control you have, the only lever you have is changing uh, the rate of fishing on the grazer. And then you have to wait for the biological dynamics to play out. And we've heard that with a comment that, uh, say, the ground fish, uh, along the, the Pacific coast take a long time to recover. And, but this is pretty dramatic here. If you try and have things where you're sort of on the wrong side of that hysteresis curve, where you're, with it, if you keep things as they are, the system would collapse. And here what I'm gonna do is say, uh, what happens if you reduce uh, fishing, complete reduction in fishing uh, from, from a system where you parameterize it according to current conditions, in the Caribbean, you've, after five years, you've reduced the coral cover but from, say, 50% to a little over 30%. And politically, people would say, gee, you've, you've destroyed my li livelihood. You've done other things, and things have gotten 
gotten worse rather than better, and you have to wait 10 years for them to recover. And if you have a more realistic 65% reduction in fishing, from, go from a 20-year time scale to a 200-year time scale, and yes, with ocean acidification, all sorts of other things may happen in that time frame. And uh, then, in fact, you would get, uh, uh, not even get back to where you were for uh, essentially 50 years. And so one of the things that one might want to do is be able to say, can we predict before we cross, and when we're at this region where we're about to run into trouble by moving to too low a grazing level, do we see signs of what's going on there? And this is something that has been the subject of quite a bit of research uh, recently uh, by people actually very much building on that example, I showed the pictures of the uh, oligotrophic and eutrophic lakes uh, where you have the shift. And Martin Scheffer and uh, Steve Carpenter and others have, have gone this, and, and it's based a lot of their thinking is based on these cartoons where for some reason copied from them, they shifted from the left to the right by flipping it. But the idea would be that as you are far from the transition, you have a system where you get uh, uh, a ball essentially in a, uh, in a potential in the well, and the ball will go down to the bottom. And if you get this side drops, 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 as you're moving closer to the case where the system's going to fall apart, you would get to the system on the right where the rate at which the ball would approach the equilibrium will be slower because it's, it's, it's not as steep, and where it will spend more time on one side than the other because one side is steeper than the other, et cetera. And what you'd like is essentially to be able to see some kind of warning sign like this uh, that would tell you that you're about to get into trouble. Now, before I even go and try and point out some issues uh, 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 with, with the picture that I've just drawn, if you, that picture really holds, I want to point out that there are at least three important issues with this idea that we're going to be able to see when there's about to be a big regime shift. One, which I'll do first, is more complicated dynamics. Then I'll return to the picture of those balls in the wells. And then I'll very briefly mention an issue of difficulties of using historical data to try and understand our ability to detect these regime shifts. And so um, that picture I showed you of the ball in the cup that where the side of the cup is going down is a saddle node bifurcation. And the idea would be is that the only way that you can change the dynamics of a system and change it so you go through a threshold. And I'll skip all sorts of stuff. Uh, but it actually, it all has to do with the idea that lots of ecological systems involve very strong interactions. And once you have multiple species interacting in a very strong way, that in general, not only is that picture not necessarily correct, but you can't draw any picture that has essentially a ball on the surface, that you can't draw what's called a potential because there is no potential. And once there is no potential, you can have a sudden shift with absolutely no warning. And uh, that's the content of this slide, which uses all sorts of fancy words, and crisis really is a technical term. And what you can do is show that, in fact, uh, very simple ecological models, such as uh, things that are, you take a, a description using coupled Ricker models, the Ricker model being one that's used a lot in fisheries. You couple a cu couple of those together, and you can have a sudden shift without any possibility of warning ahead. And I should emphasize that these are shifts in the presence of, of stochasticity and noise. What happened? Oh, I just did something. Okay. I guess just covering up uh, what's here. Oh, it's not a touch screen. <laughs> Because it just showed up this this uh, thing about the use of the network or something, and I tried to touch it and make it go away. It didn't. Okay, so uh, let's instead now concentrate, in particular, on the 
what happens? Can we see one of these sort of classic transitions coming? And uh, this is some work uh, done, a lot of it uh, primarily, or, or done with a former student, Carl Bettiger, who's uh, be starting at Berkeley in the fall. And so one can look back and, and look at data, for example, the, some catastrophic transitions. This one is probably not a negative catastrophe, but a positive one, the end of the last glacial period. But then there are other things like the collapse of, uh, of uh, fisheries that have already happened. And so what one can do is go back to this picture, which I'm going to show you again, and then emphasize what I said, that as you change a parameter, as you say, change the amount, uh, ocean acidification, there's a change, at, uh, some sort of change due to global climate change of another sort as well, you get, in theory, you get these ideas of critical slowing down. You get an increase in the variance. This ball will spend, shift back and forth more. There'll be autocorrelation because it'll tend to spend more time on one side than the other. And that goes along with skew. And so what you do is you hope to foresee one of these shifts by looking at the data. And you have some measure that you get from this, uh, from this system. And you would like to know, have you seen some indicator that says that the system is about to shift? So in theory, you can do, uh, take some action either to prevent the shift or to prepare to uh, adapt if the shift occurs that will uh, preserve some kinds of ecosystem services in the context of what we're, we're talking about. And one aspect is that people have tried to do this to try and understand this experimentally. And these are two classic examples that if something in the last few years can be called classic of what people have done. And they've done it experimentally with uh, in comparison to a control system. So the system on the left was something by uh, John Drake and Blake Griffin, which actually is not even quite the same bifurcation, but it's close enough, where they looked at Daphnia in, in the laboratory, and they reduced their food supply, and then some of them went extinct. And they compared that to ones where they didn't reduce their food supply. And the system on the right is uh, Steve Carpenter's famous pair of lakes in Wisconsin, where he does something to one lake and compares it to what it does to the other. But both on a global scale, when thinking about the, the whole world, or at the scale of any of the particular fisheries systems that one would be looking at, you don't really have something to compare it to. You can't say, well, I'm, I'm changing something. How does what goes on in one system compare to the control where I'm not changing something? All you've got is a single time series, a single set of squiggles. And so what we're going to do is we're going to write down um, essentially uh, general models. I'm going to use likelihood approaches. Uh, we have thought about going back and doing this from a Bayesian approach, but have not uh, had a chance to really do that yet. And we're going to look at both uh, systems which are not changing and with systems where there is a regime shift, and then look at, at uh, simulations essentially of both of these for the null and for the test case, and use model likelihood as an indicator. And I can't avoid uh, a little bit of uh, equations. And what this slide says is that what we do is we write down the simplest possible system that could exhibit that kind of ball in the cup where one side of the cup is falling down and the very simplest system, and that's what normal form basically means, looks like that where R is the changing parameter and X is the state. And we've shifted so the, the, the equilibrium is zero. So think of X as the amount of fish, R is the change in the, say, the temperature. And uh, that's what we've got here. We add noise to the system. We add essentially the fact that it's stochastic because otherwise nothing can happen. And the idea would be that we compare two kinds of systems. One, where we assume that R sub t, the, the, the single parameter that's controlling it, which is exactly what underlies saying that we can relate everything to this model-free description of a catastrophic change that that is, has some value and it now is changing linearly with time. Again, the simplest possible assumption. And we compare that to a case where instead 
uh, there's no parameter change, so rather than the parameter changing with respect to time, the parameter is constant. And so that's the, we compute the likelihoods, the probability of observing uh, 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 of parameters given the observation of the data, and we compare the likelihood in the two models. And one of the aspects that uh, I know at least some people here uh, know well is that we are going to visualize the trade-offs using receiver operator characteristics. And I'll maybe go through this very, very quickly with a comment that what we want to do out of this is, is that's what's useful is not to say we have shown beyond some statistical doubt that there is going to be a regime shift or we reject the null hypothesis that there's going to be a regime shift. What we'd like to do is as, as essentially a scientific analysis provide the probability that given some observation of the data of some time series, what is the probability that there's going to be a regime shift? What's the best estimate of the probability there's not going to be a regime shift? And then use that information to uh, provide to people who are in the posi position to make decisions about how to either uh, invest resources in pre potentially preventing a shift or in ad adapting to it. And I just want to point out that receiver operator characteristics, which essentially uh, what we're doing here is calculating out for any value of a test statistic, applying the probability that it represents a false positive versus a true positive. And if you have a really good statistic, it would go along the, the, uh, the go straight here and then straight down. If your statistic told you no information, it would essentially lie there, where those colors are the, uh, uh, the, the distributions of the statistics under the uh, underlying model that there really is going to be a change or there really is no change. And so as you pull those distributions apart, the receiver operator characteristic actually gives you a good description. Uh, one brief comment, since I went over this very fast, is that the Wikipedia article on this is actually surprisingly good. Um, and it comes out of, uh, comes out of actually uh, first out of, I guess, radar and, and stuff, stuff in, in World War II. And so uh, what we can do is we can uh, calculate out our approach, and our approach works very well and does better than, than others. And so uh, let me uh, finish by saying that we can estimate uh, false alarms. Uh, we can estimate uh, the failed detection. We can use this to feed into management dec decisions. And uh, this shows uh, ways to do this. There's a bunch of references here. Uh, the very last aspect would be that if you try and use past shifts as a confirmation, if you try and look at historical data, you've got a severe problem in the sense that it ends up being an example of what's known as the prosecutor's fallacy, which is this misuse of conditional probabilities made famous, perhaps, in the O.J. Simpson case. And uh, I want to finish with, with one other point in this, this slide, which is that what I was talking about were cases where you had hysteresis, but we're just as worried about cases where you have a sudden change without the hysteresis, so a sheer cliff rather than a collapsing cliff. And, uh, Basically, uh, as, as final conclusions, is that we need to design uh, realistic statistical approaches, but designed with the right goals in mind. So rather than trying to sort of scientifically say there's going to be uh, a, uh, a, uh, a shift or not, but actually this idea of doing it with, with the goal of providing information in terms of, of providing information to managers of the probability of shifts, we should recognize limited statistics. There's issues of time scales which, which have come up here. And also, ideally, we should get as detailed a model description as possible and include the kinds of nonlinearities and density dependence and strong interactions among species which may be present. And these are challenges because, as we've heard this morning, that a lot of what has been done, a lot of the focus is on single species systems, and those will, will may miss the kinds of uh, dramatic shifts that may occur. And so uh, that's probably a good place to stop. I've used up my time. And yes, Chris.
Okay, Alan, thank you very much. This is super interesting to me. Um, but you didn't address what, from an economist's perspective, is the most interesting aspect. And so I want to ask you something and have you make some comments on it. So it seems to me that how you, how society or managers would efficiently respond to the probability that you can now supply them, okay, how they do that depends on two key features. First of all, what causes the shift? Is the shift caused by the state of the system getting to a certain point? Is the shift caused by the control that you're doing? You know, you're, fi you're catching too many fish. Or is the shift purely exogenous? Is it ocean acidification? It has nothing to do with how hard you're fishing. So it depends on that. And then it must also depend on how hard it is to get back from the, ba the bad state. And that raises, I think, an interesting aquaculture question. Could you recover from the bad state by pumping fish into the system through aquaculture, for example, to recover the system quickly so you didn't have to wait 50 years? So one thing I should point out, actually, that reminds me is that there's a recent uh, issue of philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, which has a bunch of uh, papers about regime shifts in a marine system. I think it, I can't remember whether it's a late, two, four, late 14 pub date or an early 15 pub date. And what you're raising, I think, is a very important issue, is that people have tried to emphasize this idea of trying to look for general indicators of regime shifts. If you do that, you're missing some of the pieces that you have raised, which is what's causing it. And one of the aspects, too, to emphasize, which, which may have gone through a little bit fast, and I guess I'd is that once you get close to the tipping point, the shift can occur in two ways. One, just fluctuations can push a system over, or the system can continue to deteriorate, and then it, it naturally falls, falls down. But I would argue that these general indicators, what they can then do would say, OK, suggest that there is a problem. And then to answer the questions that you raise, Again, I would emphasize that there's no, essentially no free lunch. You've got then to have a much more specific uh, model or specific theory or specific understanding of a particular system so you know whether or not it's the ocean acidification or fishing. To some extent, let's say you're thinking that, that conditions are deteriorating, then what you, could, you can't change the amount, the, you may not be able to have a, a strong effect on, on, say, ocean conditions, temperature, acidification, et cetera, but you might be able to change the fishing pressure. And we've summarized this as though it's one dimensional, as though there's a single parameter, but presumably, of course, here there are multiple ones. And so the issues you raise, I think, are important. And these are ones that need to be addressed in this kind of context much more than they have been. Uh, we were viewed somewhat as sort of uh, uh, skeptics and maybe less polite words, et cetera. But if you read some of the uh, uh, more recent uh, papers, like the, the sort of the lead article in that uh, uh, Philosophical Transactions was a summary that sort of basically repeats a lot of the points that uh, we've been making, which are ones of preaching a lot of caution here. And so some of it is just being aware that these kinds of things can happen, I think, is a, a very important first step. Hi. Um, for, for those who do paleoclimate, could you talk a little bit more, and, and maybe you just kind of address this. Um, you spoke quickly about the um, Misuse of conditional probabilities and talking yes. about dangers of historical data. Um, so, oh. how would you talk to a paleoclimatologist <laughs> about what they're doing using um, sort of justification for their work, projecting what might happen? So, what I the point I would would make there is that uh, if in fact you look back at the historical record and you see there's been a shift, yeah, say end of, a, end, end of glaciation, there are, a bunch, there are a number of others that people have looked at. What people have done then is looked before that shift and say, have I seen a signal? As a matter of fact, they even, and that clearly has severe problems. And even if, for example, 
uh, you ask whether or not the system has had skew before that. Yes, in fact, it has to have gotten near the kinds of conditions that would be starting to change. So a change in temperature or a change in, in something else. I've never been in a room that doesn't have a board, which is what I'd want now, but maybe I, <laughs> or, uh, but what happens is that you could have that same kind of shift without it producing the same kind of tendency towards about to look like it's about to shift without it shifting. And the fact that it actually has, does it even after you have the shift, it's still no, no more likely to have shifted then because there's been no underlying change. And some of that is the idea of the only way it can uh, sort of leave a, a bowl that looks like this is to do so relatively rapidly. So there has to be some skew and autocorrelation, but it's a false signal. So it's exactly this sort of aspect that, uh, so if somebody gets a, uh, uh, who, who's in a very low risk group gets a positive AIDS test, and you say, well, it has a very, very small a false positive, but the person really shouldn't be that worried because the number of false positives, is, the number of false positives is still much higher among the population who really don't have AIDS. And it's this misapplication for looking at the, trying to understand can we get signals by looking at historical data. And so it's this idea that we've got this really big problem. We only have a single realization. And it's a single realization. Dealing with single realizations raises all sorts of issues for thinking about the role of stochasticity in ecological systems. And not only that, but most of the theory we have is the one that I put up there, which is small noise, little tiny jiggles. But we've got you know, big jiggles that, that are caused by all sorts of external things. Could be you know, solar storms, could be all sorts of things. And that incorporating this into ecological uh, thinking is very, very hard. All right. Um, I was wondering if, when you mentioned that you need the need for realistic statistical approaches, if you kind of envision models based on certain systems that incorporate, you know, the ecological context, um, as well as whether the models that you've talked about include not just understanding the factors involved in the transition, but you know, the feedbacks that maintain either state and how that can be used, you know, in management. So I would argue strongly that you want to have models that incorporate the specific system. So I went through the, the coral, a lot of the work on the, the transitions and lakes, people have written down simple models. And then based on that, they said, oh, well, let's look for general indicators. And I think there's, that th there can be some grave dangers with doing that. And so very much if you want to try and understand how management actions are going to work, that even if you find something from one of these general indicators that you're going to want to go to a specific understanding of a particular system. But I think there's also just some great value in recognizing that these kinds of transitions can occur. There's other problems which I didn't even have time to raise here with looking for general ones. And uh, the other one is that once you have systems which are strongly interacting, you're not going to see the same kinds of early warning signs just will not be present. All right, thanks so much, Alan.